Okay, my name is Brett Davis, and I am uh, the owner, the designer, the operator, whatever you want to call it, the jack of all trades, wears the many hats of XPIN. Uh, and today I wanted to just talk about what I'm seeing a little bit with regard to how the pinball landscape is evolving. There's a lot that's happening in this industry, uh, this hobby, which is really exciting, as I was talking to John over here earlier. And so, next slide. So when I started thinking about how I wanted to put this out, I wanted, first off, to provide the definition of evolution. It says that evolution is a gradual process in which something changes into a different and usually more complex or better form which is important, because that's exactly what we're seeing in pinball today. We're seeing this evolution, and sometimes it's a little gradual. There are, you know, some things are coming about kicking and screaming, you know, but some things are being really forced upon us. You know, so it, it happens. So the next, next slide. So f before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are legacy technology, things that we have out there right now that are in the games that have been in there for you know 20 30 years we have bi junction transistors bjt's you know darling compare transistors and some of these part numbers if you have pinball machines you'll actually recognize them you know tip 122s 36c's and so on and so forth linear power supplies back in the 70s and 80s linear power supplies were by far the most common technology used to power any electronic circuitry. The reason why they're common because it was cheap and simple to design for. Yes, switching technology, switching power supplies were available back then. The designs were there, the technology was there, but it usually came with a pretty hefty price tag. So it really wasn't conducive to the pinball marketplace. Problems with linear power supplies is that generated lots of heat. How many of you have actually seen or touch those heat sinks in the back box. They get warm. <laughs> they do get warm. Uh, um, and with that, that heat, that's an indication of very low efficiency. Yeah, you may think that, you know, you look at the back of the label on the pinball machine, it says that you're going to be drawing, you know, 120 volts, 8 amps. Okay, most of them have that label back there. Well, that 8 amps about a third of the half, almost third to half of that is lost in the heat that's generated in the game through the power supply, through your bulbs that you have there. It's just lost power. So very inefficient. Also the logic that they were using back then. You know, we had a lot of through-hole dip packages. We had PIA 6821s. We had 6802 processors, things that were, that were great top of the line back then. But nowadays, technology has put, left them in the dust. And the big thing is incandescent light bulbs. An average in the GI circuits on your pinball machines from the classic 70s and 80s, you're talking about 120 GI light bulbs in your game. That's a lot. So let's go to the next slide. So things with evolutionary technologies that are existing right now, that I am seeing and I'm observing and I'm designing with are putting in MOSFETs, a different type of technology that's lower cost nowadays. They were expensive back in the 80s, but they're much in, uh, cheaper now. But they also had the capability to handle higher powers, you know, more current, less heat dissipated. So it's, it's essentially they're a more efficient usage of technology. Uh, switching power supplies, big one there. Okay, now it's become very cost effective to use switching power supplies in your designs rather than your linear devices, linear technologies. Big plus is happening right now in, uh, in computers and logic, SBC, single board computers, like the uh, Beagle Blackboard, which is what is being used in the Medieval Madness remake by Planetary Pinball. They're using that. Uh, you have uh, much higher speed processors that are available. You know, the 6802s, 6808s, they were, they were down in four megahertz, eight megahertz, very slow. Now we have processors that are operating four, 10, eight, you know, 
significantly faster. You can do accomplish a lot more, which makes innovation very key here. Um, you see, you're starting to see FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, on boards. Stern uses those on theirs because the complexity of the game requires, you know, complex logic that can't be performed in, you know, on a circuit board if you're placing a whole bunch of chips. They had to do some custom programming. And then of course there's system on chips, which has everything that you need running on a simple single platform. Okay. Now uh, and then you have your LED bul bulbs. Everybody's got LED bulbs. Who, ha who has a game that's still running incandescent bulbs? Wow. All right. You know, like classic guys. Well, I hate to tell you there's something coming up here. Next slide. So, gets a t-shirt on this one. Okay. Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. This was passed into law states that by what year all incandescent light bulbs will be 200% more efficient than they are currently. And I'll give you a plus or minus a year on that. I got a t-shirt here. No, no. What's that? No. That was only the first step. The first step was, in, by 2012, they had to be 25% more efficient than they were in 2007. But they, what was that? 2019. 2019, well, the actual answer is 2020. And by that time, there you go. By that time, you have to have, your incandescent bulbs have to be 200% more efficient than they are right now. Guess what? Technology has stated, industry has stated, that they cannot get 200% more efficient in an incandescent bulb. So by 2020, according to the law in the US, go ahead and hit answer. Next one. We're going to be at LEDs. You're not going to be able to get those 555 bulbs except through the black market or those 47s or any of those others because they should not be manufactured. So, I mean, it, it, it happens. You know, we are be, that's one of those things that's being thrust upon us. So, you know, we have one of the biggest problems that existed with using LEDs, and we see this a lot in innovations that are coming out by a lot of innovators like myself and others. You know, the original circuit designs took into account the glow factor, what I call the glow factor or persistence. You know, it takes time to heat up that element to get that color, that light. And so in an incandescent bulb, in these types that we have, like the 555s and the you know, 47s, about 200 microseconds, a very small amount of time in a lot of people's eyes, in their minds, but it's still an amount of time. That's how long it takes to heat up that element enough so that you can visibly see it. Where the LED bulbs come into play is that it takes 15 nanoseconds, usually, to go from off to a full-on brightness. And when you think about that, it's like, wow, it's happening a lot faster. That's where you get a lot of your flicker, your, your ghosting that occurs. Not just that, is that um, it takes a, little less, a lot less current. An average 47 bulb will draw 150 milliamps of current to get to that brightness. For an LED, it's like 20 to 30 milliamps, depending on the LED bulb you have. Significantly less power, so you have less heat and it's much more efficient to use LEDs, so that's why there's a push going towards that direction. But we have to be mindful of the fact that the game designers back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s they weren't thinking in terms of LEDs. They were thinking of incandescent bulbs. They figured they had 200 microseconds to play with before anybody noticed the bulb was on. How many of you have seen flickering in LED bulbs because it happens that way? Everybody's seen flickering. I mean, your, your classic volleys, the way their circuit design is, I mean, yeah, you ha if you put an LED in the feature lamps, you're gonna see some flickering. 
It happens. It's just because of the way the circuit was designed. In your classic Williams and in your WPC era, firmware plays a big part of that because the firmware itself tended to be a little on the sloppy side because they knew they can, they can, they didn't have to be so tightly bound. They weren't looking at 15 nanoseconds. They were looking at 100 microseconds. And so they can switch to something in the wrong order, which you'll see sometimes in a lot of the game code when you're putting LEDs in the games, in the feature lamps. Next one. So one of the things that I've done with conjunction of Sean, and Sean's here with me today, is that he came up with this great idea on how to, a low cost method, method for flicker free operation in the classic Bali system. Uh, and there are other solutions out there for the classic volleys. A great one is the Alltech solution for the replacement lamp driver board. They actually incorporate this into their board itself for flicker-free operation of their, for, of their feature lamps. Uh, what we did was we approached it from a different standpoint. Sean came up with the idea and that what we have here is that we have uh, three separate little boards that plug into the three main connections onto the lamp driver board. So you don't have to give up your original lamp driver board. Your original lamp driver board, those boards were built solid. They had a great design, but they were designed around incandescence. But what we've, what's happened is that we took these little boards, created them, and now we have the ability to operate flicker free at a much lower cost. And that's what it comes down to, okay? Pinball guys, we like saving money. We don't want to invest, you know, $100, $200 if we don't want to. You know, if we don't have to. <coughs> this is an alternative to get that flicker-free operation. And if you're interested in seeing this in operation, right now we actually, at the X-Pin booth, we have a hot doggin with this installed. So really simple and easy to go with. So it's a great solution. And this is how we are taking the, the classic games and evolving them to adapt to the new technology. Next slide. So this next circuit gets a free t-shirt on this one too. Can anybody tell me what this circuit is and where it's located? It's a very common circuit. I can tell you it was used in something like 25 different games different boards. Anybody? Okay, click it again, you're gonna get another picture. Maybe this will help you. Anybody recognize that? It's the same circuit, it's just on the board. I will go with that. It is on this, that particular circuit, go ahead, click again. It's, it's the driver circuit on the Data East power on the PPB board. Uh, now, why did I pick on this circuit? Well, this circuit is a, for me, it's a classic for me because I can tell you I have replaced more TIP 36Cs than I care to admit, uh, admit to. Because as I've rebuilt games, you know, and solenoids and driver circuits and everything else, yeah, you're going to lose that if, if something else is happening in the game. If the solenoid locks on, if the MPU has turned it on and just won't let it release, there's a problem like that, you're going to lose that. And so, I mean, it's one of those areas in that. Now, the TIP 36C, it's actually a bi-junction transistor Darlington pair combination. Some interesting facts about it. Supposedly, it can handle up to 125 watts. That's a lot of heat. Also, it can handle up to 50 amps of current through that. But unless you know what's going on, that's those two requirements, that only applies if you have a big old heat sink to dissipate all the heat that it's going to be generating. You don't see any heat sink there. These are operated as if it was a pulsed system. If it's pulsed for a short duration of time, yes, you don't have to have a heat sink there for a short period of time. And that's what the solenoids do. You pulse them on, activates the solenoid, 
and then it releases. So it's only for a short amount of time. Well, as we know, when the solenoid gets locked on, you're driving, you got current flowing through that, you're gonna generate a lot of heat, and it just cannot sustain that heat for anything for a very long period of time. Because you can get, dig down as an, as an electrical engineer, I dig down into the data sheets to choose the parts that I want. And if I was looking at a constant on situation, I'd have a big old chunk of aluminum on that, on that device. You don't see those. Okay, next slide. So here it is. Here's your data ease power uh, driver board. Notice that you had four. You know, you have five of those big old transistors there. Lots of heat. You have those resistors there, the, the big heat resistors there, or the power resistors there. That's also to take up some of the power as well, particularly when it comes into the flashing circuits. But I mean, great example of what they've done here, but no heat sinks. Next slide. Way I look at it from the evolutionary step for this, for the, for this circuit is a, is a redesign. Uh, as I mentioned before, the design assumptions back in those time when they designed the circuit was that it would never lock on. Okay, how many times have we thought that? Why would it lock on? Electronics never fail. We should never have to worry about those worst case conditions, but those conditions exist. We see them, we see them in the games that we play, we deal with, we operate with. Uh, and in the case of the TIP 36C, chances are, the likelihood is, is that your 36C will burn up before the fuse is burned out, before you blow the fuse. I've seen that happen, and I was fused correctly. I've seen that happen. I got a design here for another board that instead of using that TIP 36C, I'm using this, uh, this FET. And it, the technology today behind the FETs are really smart. There's a lot of built-in safeties there. These devices here nowadays, they actually have something in them that will prevent them from going into an overcurrent situation. They will shut themselves down rather than burning themselves out. Uh, and that's what we've got going on here. In this particular case, this particular device, your fuse will blow before this one will burn up. Next slide. And this is one of my pro new products I have. I had this out at my floor. This is, uh, this is a replacement for that power driver board. Uh, and these little devices in the bottom left, Q1, Q2, Q3, 4, and 5, that's replacing that big old tip 36C. Uh, we've actually taken this and we've actually shorted the outputs to drive that thing hard. Okay, and my fuse will still blow before that will. I'll be able to just go with it. So that's part of the evolutionary step is to make sure that we fix all the problems that were, that they weren't problems back then, but over time we've realized that they are. They're design issues that have to be addressed. And that's part of the evolutionary process. Next one. All right, another one. This is a big one. Who can tell me where this is at? Anybody have any idea? Big hint, it's a BCD to seven segment decoder. Okay. If you know anything about XPen, I'm big into displays. Okay, which game? Or which games? I can tell you over 500,000 of these games were made with this circuit. Okay, another big hint. Another big hint. There's at least five of these in every one of those games. Yes, it is. You want another shirt? Who wants a shirt? All right. Yes, this is this is the seven segment decoder circuit. Go ahead. For a classic Bali or Stern six and seven digit display. There 
there's a lot of those out there. How many of you had to re have had to repair those boards before? Okay, that, that board, I mean, it's a good circuit design, yes. You know, it's very robust. And if you think about it, here we have these many games. Now this is, these are six digit games. Now if you kind of kind of get a feel for that, I'm leading up a little bit to talk about my solution system. Okay, but 45 games there, all six digit games. A lot there. Great titles there too. Matahari, Embryon, Knight Rider, Kiss. How many have rolled their six digit classic volley games before? All right, you've rolled them. Once you've rolled it though, it's kind of like you lose interest because you never see that high score again. It happens. As part of the evolution of games, to keep these games moving forward, we came, I came up with this evolution system. And part of it is, is that why do, we, why do these games need to evolve? They're highly collectible. A lot of great titles. Bali Playboy, great title. Yeah, you got your Matahari. People talk about collecting, looking for that Matahari that they like. Embryon, Kiss. Kiss is a great title to have because it's iconic for that era. And it's also considered to be one of the easiest to roll. So people look at that. But if they're not, if the games haven't been modified, once you hit that 999,000 point, you roll past it, you never see that score again because the game itself starts overriding those six digits for your scoring. Kind of sad. Really, it is kind of sad in that aspect. And of course, you know, if you have the million points, it's always, you know, it'd be nice to be able to brag about it. Right now, I got friends who don't have a Sevolution system and they say, well, I've rolled it three times in a single game. I said, okay, where's the proof? Don't see it, can't see it. it goes forward. Next slide. So what I did was I came up with the evolution. Now there's a story about the evolution and how I came up with this idea. Back in 2008, I was at the Northwest Pinball Show, and I had hauled all the way from Boise, Idaho, my six million dollar man, and it was showing my my products in those displays at that time. And there is a gentleman there, and he just loves that game. You know, he loved it with a passion. He sat there and he was playing right in front of my booth for 45 minutes. And while I was watching them, I was like, wow, he knows how to play the game. And then I saw that he was, he rolled it. And then, and then it started over again. I said, well, well, that's kind of sad. But he kept playing it and he rolled it again. He rolled three times while standing there and it was still a single play game. Incredible. And afterwards we started talking about it and he taught, started telling me about the problems with this and that, how these great classic games could not, would not keep track of their score after they rolled past that um, one million point. And how he would love to see that sometimes happen. So that's what really sparked the idea behind Sevolution. So it's been a while in the making. Uh, so I call it I call this evolution because it is an evolutionary step from a six digit to a seven digit game. It will hold the high score over a million. And it'll take it all the way up to nine million nine hundred and ninety-nine thousand. After that I can't get another digit in. Sorry guys. It just won't fit in the window. But it will take a long time to get that nine hundred and ninety-nine million. Uh, it holds this, your score across power cycles. So you don't have to worry about that. You turn the game off for, you know, for a couple weeks and go back in, and there your high score is again. You know you accomplished that. Awesome. It also shows the high score during a track mode. You know how hard it is to do that? There is so much that's going on in the MPU to try to keep track of those displays and see what's happening. To actually get that up there during the track mode it was a little challenge on the firmware standpoint. And a key to this development was that nothing, 
nothing needed to be touched. It needed to be a plug and play solution. <coughs> no one wants to modify the game ROMs. Modification of the game ROMs implies that you may have changed something in the gameplay, green rules, whatever. No one wants to add a wire to get to that seventh digit. Okay? No one wants to do that. Okay? No one wants to hack the MPU board. They don't, people are terrified of that, of making modifications. You play, your person that has these games, they don't want to be cutting traces. They don't want to be adding wires. It had to be plug and play so that it could truly evolve. So a service-free aspect. Go to the next one. And that's what I did. Now the key thing about this is that when I was talking about processors and capabilities and evolution and growing and speed, in order to accomplish this evolution, yes, I had to incorporate a processor. Over there on the left picture, you see what I've done. Those two boards right there are the key to making Sevolution possible. I plug those directly on the MPU board. It doesn't talk to the MPU board, but I am watching what is being put on the displays. I'm keeping track of it. And when I need to change, I take control of the displays. In order to do that though, I have to be operating significantly faster than the processor on the MPU board to accomplish all this stuff. So I'm actually operating, you know, 48 megahertz. You know, which may not seem like that fast considering a lot of things, but also needed to be cost effective. And I didn't need to go much faster than that to accomplish everything I needed. But with that, I'm able to generate, keep track of your seventh digit and then process it. Now, get asked this a lot about my Sevolution system. Can I just take a Sevolution system and drop it in the seven digit game? The answer is no. And the reason why is because that seventh wire. Okay, in the six digit game, you don't have that seventh wire. You only have the six digits for the digit enables. Uh, what I did was, in combination with, a, with the display itself, I actually have a, an additional chip on the display that I load up, which allows me to just send three wires, use three wires of that six, and with that I can get seven digits. I just have a decoder on there. So with the system, you now have that capability. Growing, go ahead, next slide. You know, pinball is evolving. Everything that's happening here, the great thing about coming to shows is that you see some of these innovations. And that in order to keep these classic games alive, these late 70s going into the 80s, they have to evolve too. They have to take on new technology. They have to be willing to, you know, owners and players of these games have to be willing to accept that they want to keep that piece of their childhood or whatever reason they're collecting. They want to keep them running. They've got to be willing to allow the game to evolve. Um, and that's what the new technology allows us to do. It keeps that there. I mean, we've had a great time to, you know, here at the show. You know, last night, some, you know, at my booth, we have this hot dog and set up with, with the Sevolution set. And last night, someone sat there and they actually played the game, and they sat there and played it, and they actually scored past a million. He was so excited. I, I gave him. A, I, I had. A, I had another T-shirt. I gave it to him. Uh, great. This morning, someone came in. This morning, he stood there for 30 minutes. He wanted to beat that. He wanted to have that challenge. This game, I've never rolled past a million. I'm going to do it now. And he did that. That kind of operation, those kind of feelings are what keeps this hobby alive, that, that challenge, that excitement. And it's with this, you know, these, these innovators, myself, Sean, I mentioned a few other companies, groups. You know, Craig Aker over, you know, he's developed his Energy, Energy I series, or board, great board. 
It handles, it takes, uh, it takes your GI lights and with what he's developed is that it will then, it gives it the glow factor so that in certain games, instead of if you LED it, flipping on and off, I mean, that's, that's irritating. But he's developed a methodology that it will ramp the GIs, and if they're LEDs, they'll ramp them and you know, ramp them up and down when it's cycled, so it gives you the impression of that it's actually truly a light bulb. Great thing that he did there. I'm excited to see that. Mike Pupo over Flipper Fidelity and some of his sound systems that he's developing. You know, the speaker setups that he's got going and how he's improving things. Another great innovator that makes these games sound great. Awesome, awesome setup. If you've been over to Pin Sound, and if you take a look at their booth and their board that they've created, that is awesome. System 11C all the way up to, you know, into your WPC and your Data East games. A sound system now to replace all the problems that exist in all those sound cards. Uh, a universal board in that aspect. With the additional ability to insert your own sound. Wow, put some custom sounds into your games. Let's say you're playing Guns N' Roses. You know, actually get more of the soundtracks in there while you're playing the game. Awesome. That kind of innovation drives people because they would like to have that. You know, multimorphic in their P-Rock system. Game changer, it makes people like you, like myself, who really want to go out and start developing you know, hey, can I actually make a pinball machine or do some customization? It's a platform that they can now, people can easily invest in and jump in and look at and come up with something. You know, Spooky Pinball, what they did. Ben Hex, you know, controller board. I can go on and name numbers of innovators in this. And as they continue developing products, it continues the evolution of the pinball machine and bringing them out. You know, we've been, as collectors and hobbyists, we've been, historically, we were always looking for Stern or, in case, Jersey Jack, you know, to be the innovators, to make improvements to these games that we've grown to love and play. But in reality, it's the hobbyists themselves who are seeing these needs and are becoming the innovators. And that's what's, that's what's really cool. Because as we continue moving forward, we're gonna see more of this going on to keep these games alive. That's all I had. Appreciate your time, come out and listen to me. Come down to my booth if you wanna see some of the stuff I have up here, or even see some of my other boards. Uh, we have, uh, I have the samples of the driver boards and a few other things that I've got going on if you're interested in what I'm doing. And uh, we, Try getting a, a green T-shirt. Roll that million dollar, roll the million points on the hot dog. In. All right. Thanks. Oh, is there any questions? I should ask questions. Any questions? No questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, you were talking about the, the change in law um, about incandescent bulbs having become 200% as efficient as they are now. No, as they were in 2007. As they were in 2007, right, okay, and, and the fact that technology hasn't changed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that law? Is it, is it a US law? Is it, it a global agreement? And it, does it in fact definitely apply to low voltage lamps as well? It is only applying right now to the US, that law. I spent a little time reading over what they wanted to do. Um, the first step, as I said, was to take place in 2012, uh, where they were saying it has to be 25%. And that's why here in the US, you might have seen a lot of discussion, go out and buy your 60 watt light bulbs or your 40 watt incandescent bulbs because they're no longer gonna be available. Well, guess what? Those light bulbs have pretty much started to disappear. You know, you can still find in the dollar store, you can find some 60 watt and 40 watt incandescents. But you, you're, it's not happening. 
Now, all, there are other alternatives to technology, you know, based upon you know what's available. You know, you got LEDs, you got CFLs, you know, fluorescent bulbs. Those things are there, coming are still going to be viable. But the incandescents, they were looking at from a carbon footprint. From my reading of the law, they were looking at the carbon footprint, the reason why they're disc, you know, discontinuing them, as well as the fact that they were essentially big energy wasters. I mean, to get that, you know, you can get this, if you look at it, you know, I can get it, you know, we look at our LED bulbs in the games, prime example. I mean, yeah, you get the same line of light, you know, as you would at 555 bulb, and the 555 bulbs are cheap. There's no question about that they're cheap, but at the same time, you think about how much heat those generate. You get, you get a situation where you have the heat generated, you're 150 milliamps, all that power loss, you know, it's, that is applied to the larger scale to your larger bulb. So right now, to go back to answering your question, to the best of my knowledge, it is only a U.S. Directive, but it's setting the stage for all across the, across the globe. And it applies to low voltage bulbs. Pardon? And it applies to low voltage bulbs, not just. Yes. Yes, that's it. On the, you know, in the 2007, it did not limit itself. It said all incandescents. You know, left it right there. All incandescents. Questions? Any more questions? Yes. Oh. You mentioned on your um, on the seven-digit adapter board display board that your goal was to create a a product that didn't require any change to the system at all. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming though that without that ability of the ROM to and the and the CPU to keep track of it itself, it doesn't keep things like high score and and high score levels to go to get replays and stuff like that. That's still okay. Good question. I'm only concerned with what's happening on the display. The game continues to keep track of, if you go in and set up the replay levels, you still do that as normal. Still follows that, okay? You set up the rule change and everything else there. What, uh, I'm just, the high score, okay, you may set a high score, you know, you see a high score when you're going through the information, when you're going through the audit screens. But if you have a high score of over that one million points, okay, you won't see that in the game ROM set up in the audit screens. You won't see that because I do not put that high score or manage it in the game ROM or in the game RAM. I store that high score and keep track of it on my little adapter board. So the game itself has no recognition that that high score is there. Right, that's understood. So my, quite, my I guess what my point would be is, would you have any interest in development of the actual firmware to be able to keep track of it internally, so that it would have those extra features? Like, like I'm assuming your your high score gets erased after you start another game because it's reusing the display for its normal purpose. Okay. Hello. In actuality, the best platform for doing what you're suggesting is the Alltech platform. Now, I have an inquiry into Dave Seidman over at Alltech saying, hey, I've got this. Would you be willing to look at a little collaboration to allow, you know, to take what I've done and instead of, you know, putting the uh, my entire, you know, instead of needing to have the the uh, my daughter boards plugging into the MPU, but he can modify the game code, his wrapper that he has in his firmware, so that he can still that he would take advantage of my displays, because as I said, on each one of the displays I have a little decoder chip that only requires three of the six wires. The big thing that people don't like about some of the solutions that have been out there before is that you are always having to add a wire to get that seventh digit. Well, I don't have to have that wire, but it would require him to make a modification to the code instead of sending out seven wires 
for the display that he's only looking at those three wires and sending me out and encoded. I've asked him about it. I haven't heard back from him, but it's a possible solution to bring that about. Any other questions? Yes. You got a microphone. A my year seven evolution board. I put it in a game. Uh, happy with it. I'm transported. It falls off the truck. I'm, I'm going to save parts, so I'm going to take your boards now and put it in a different game. I had a high number saved on that board that was in the first game. Mm -hmm. What happens to that? It's still it's still stored in there, but there is a method for you to reset that high score. Basically, when you want to reset the high score, you turn the game on. Okay, if you want to start off, what, you don't want to be seeing that high score now, like if it's 2 million, you know, new game. You just go in, there's a little button on the board, you hold it until it flashes. And then what it does is it cleans out the flash inside my board. And what will then be displayed is whatever high score was on the original, it's on, sitting on that MPU at that point in time. Yes. So it looks like for the uh, Seven Illusion game, you have a white version that you can put the gels to make the different colors. Absolutely. Has, has anybody come up with a seven segment display that's like a tri-color where you could actually change the color on the fly? So as you got in a different game mode, you could make the displays change color. I don't know if that exists or not, or if you've seen it. Those do exist. Those do exist, but the, but you also have to take into account that the controls don't exist in the game itself. Now I could put I could put you know it's an RGB block. I could put a jumper there that says okay I'm going to turn on all the I'm going to be using red, but then it's going to be red across everything, or green or blue or a combination at that point. But unless the game knows that it's RGB and can provide those different effects not going to happen. That's not to say that I couldn't adapt. Well, oh gosh. <laughs> With Sevolution, if I wanted to put those blocks there, I probably could then control it and really make it exciting because it's my processor now that's talking to it, not the game code. But again, it's, you know, with any kind of product development, it's all about, you know, where you want to put your effort, time and effort, money, you know, and what's the return going to be. You know, I'm just, I'm a businessman as well. I mean, it has to be, you know, profitable to me to, to invest in that. Now, if I, if somebody came up and said, oh yeah, we're going to do, we want to buy 2,000 of these things and you, you know, we want this feature, i say, okay, because <laughs> it, it becomes profitable to me at that point. Right now, everything, that, all my products that I have come about simply because there was a need there. So, more questions. This is great. Anything else? Well, thank you for your time. Now, I got two more shirts up here, if anybody wants one. Oh, okay, James, if you want one. Oh. Me? <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay, let's see. Excels. If you want a little bit larger one, I got a little bit larger one out in my booth. So, all right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate your time.